and uh, welcome to Free Metal Sailing Club's Topic Night for March. Our guest presenters today are Janneke Kopers and her husband Mietze van der Lang, two in adventurous Dutch sailors who have been making their way around the globe for the past seven years. They're welcomed tonight by Free Metal Sailing Club's Steve Parkinson. The reason we've all come here tonight is we have uh, Witze <coughs> van der Lang. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah. And uh, Yannick Coasters yeah. here visiting in their cruising boat from the Netherlands. Um, so thank you very much, the pair of you. And uh, as we've seen a bit already, the Dutch have a long history of sailing this coast. With any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome you and look forward to hearing about your cool stories tonight. <laughs> okay. Thanks. In Dutch, my name is Janneke, and that is Vitsa, but we listen also to Hey and Hey You. <laughs> Don't even try to pronounce it. Richard and Joanne is the English version of our names. That's, uh, it's, you're more comfortable with that. Um, this is how it goes tonight, because we have almost 200 slides. We have a wide audience. Thank you for coming in with such large numbers. We're really, really flattered. Um, the thing is that we have to go quick because we understand that a lot of you need to be out here in about an hour. So we're going to be really quick. So if you have a short question, ask it. Otherwise, keep it. And then at the end, our commute is very short to the boat. So uh, at the end, we'll hang around here for a long, long time. And you can ask any question you want. But we'll make sure at the end we have about 15 minutes. Beach is the time manager. He manages the clicker. And he knows in 25 minutes, I need to be in Puerto Montt's ship. So, that's where we're going. Um, so, if we can sort of agree on that, that's going to work to get you, to show you a lot of really nice uh, pictures. There are some people in the room who sailed around the world, and that makes us very humble, because we haven't yet. So, we hope we can make the evening worth your while. Oh, I, I supp I'm supposed to stand here. here. Are you? Okay. Oh. I'm not supposed to move, because it's going to be filmed for on YouTube. This is us in uh, Antarctica. You see a uh, blue boat with a white deck, which tells you, no matter where in the world you are, that that is a Dutch steel boat. Those are the traditional colors, and if you look at the end of the collector jet, you'll see a blue boat with a white deck, Dutch steel boat. That boat is an old Navy ship, and is now a research vessel that goes to Antarctica. So this picture was made on Antarctica, because we ended up, we had a bit of an accident, so we could take our own boat there. And, uh, but that story comes later. Off we go. This is the day we left. We let go of our lines. You can tell my hair went white overnight. <laughs> and, uh, and it grew a bit. Um, so here we left and uh, this is how it started. So from the Netherlands, some of you sort of roughly know where that is in Europe, to Scotland and then um, across to Ireland, Isle of Man, Northern Ireland, Isle of Man, then we were all still friends, now that's looking a bit different. And, um, <laughs> and then to the south of Spain, so you can go with some pictures. Um, behind us is Loch Ness. So this is our boat, you know, we crossed the lake, didn't see the monster, and then we went on to uh, um, the locks. Um, the Caledonian Canal, which cuts right through Scotland, because going over the top of Scotland is a bit of a windy place, and so you have these canals, these, but they have locks, they have steps of locks, and they're rather small. So here you see a whole fleet of uh, um, rental boats, that's where the old people wear these life jackets. But it's, it's rather hard to go through. Here you see another one of these locks, you know, you, you go in one chamber and then up and then up. And so in the end you go about 30 meters up and then 30 meters down again, which takes about a week. Lots of fun. We were there with a... Uh, when there was a, a heat wave, so the Scottish uh, lockmasters were allowed to wear shorts for the first time in 100 years. And you're on your boat and you go up, you know, the water comes up and you see these legs first. <laughs> but they have such a sense of humor, because in the first lock we go in, huge slimy wall, four meters high. So I'm standing over the rope, trying to, hold, to hurl it up. And I said to the lockmaster, I said, it's the first time. And and I tried to, to throw it up, and he said, Oh, my dear, I'll be gentle. 
Okay, they do make whiskey there, so we did some sampling also, and then we took off uh, um, um, across the Gulf of Biscay. And the people in Ireland are very friendly, extremely friendly. They don't know to say, how to say no. So they said, yeah, you can go to that port to fuel up, no problem, just tie up, be quick, but it was a drying port. <laughs> and uh, our Dutch friends next to us on the, on the fin keel, we can stand on our keel, the fin keel sort of popped against us, was not good. And uh, so now we're in the north of Spain, in La Coruna, and that's where you really feel, okay, now we're leaving Europe and we're now getting somewhere. And um, a beautiful mix of old and new, very famous place uh, to go. Uh, what they have there is, um, they have uh, oh, well, it's Europe, they have a lot of old stuff, and one of which is uh, uh, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, some of you, uh, and they have forest fires also. <laughs> so you see a lot of water planes uh, uh, passing there, and, uh, and they go right through the anchorage. Uh, that's interesting. Santiago de Compostela, some of you may have heard of the Camino. It's the old pilgrimage routes that are very popular now. This is the church where everybody goes to. If you ever get a chance, it's beautiful there. It's a medieval place, it's really beautiful. Okay, um, what you see in this picture is uh, what you see a lot in Galicia, which is the north of Spain. So it's the little square bit that sits over Portugal. And um, you see these uh, statues. Jesus faces the sea, Maria faces the land. And next to it, you see a little house on stilts. Um, you see with a cross on it, those are called correos, and they put corn in there, maize, to prevent the rats eating it. It's a very old place, beautiful. Um, so we went um, in Spain, we went up the Cuadalquivir River all the way to Seville. And um, we stayed, spent five months in Seville. There were still some loose ends to tie off in the Netherlands. And also we had to brush up on our Spanish. The Dutch tend to be a bit arrogant because we speak many languages, but we want, all want to speak them good. So you notice I made mistakes, but this is the level we want to have it at. So our Spanish was not good enough, so we went to school there for five months with our backpacks and our bikes every week to be able to speak Spanish the way I speak English to you now. So Seville is known for the tile work. All the college you see here is tiles and pottery. Absolutely beautiful. And, uh, it's a very old tradition there, and this is a sort of a palace. And, um, and this is the main cathedral of Seville. And in that main cathedral, there is a grave of somebody. And I'm going to have you guess who this is. Whose grave is this? The guys carrying it are the four kings of Spain. Spain has always been a federation of kingdoms. And um, our friends of the Catalan boat are not here, otherwise I would have presented this a bit different. And who are they carrying? Who was their hero? Who opened their horizon? No, he was Portuguese. Columbus. Columbus, yes. This is Columbus's grave. Isn't it a cool grave? Yeah. I don't know where he actually is. So then we sailed to the Canary Islands, and there were um, two base camps for the preparation of the Volvo Ocean Race, because that's one Volvo Ocean Race ago. This is the old female boat with Caroline Brouwer on it, the Dutch lady who lives in Australia, who we are so proud of. And the other team was the Brunel team with Bauer Becking, a very famous uh, skipper. He um, has done eight Volvo Oceans now, I think. And um, so we went to interview him because, I forgot to tell you, we work as journalists from our boat. So we're interviewing him all nice and, and done. We walk off, he grabs Vitsa's camera bag and he says, let me take a picture of you. <laughs> so you see our surprised face is going to be standing here behind the wheel of this racing boat. And he, this, this hero of ours is taking our picture. Very funny. And uh, um, we met him again in Hobart with Christmas. Um, and he said, are you still sailing around the world? Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, then we went to the Cape Verde, nicknamed Africa Light. And uh, this is the fish market. So it's a really... It's a very poor country, very dependent on, um, on subsidies from countries like the Netherlands. Okay, then we crossed the Atlantic to Brazil. And uh, we arrived in Salvador de Bahia um, at the uh, a moment that a lot of people are very excited about the fact that we were in Brazil. Well, there's one sport that we know something about, which is sailing, and a lot of other sports which involve people running behind balls. 
we don't know anything about. So people got really excited and we thought, what is going on? So we Google Brazil 2014 and it was a world championship of football. So then we Googled, does the Netherlands play in this? Oh shit, they do. So uh, um, we quickly learned a lot about football that time. You know that they do two times 45 minutes? We thought after 45 minutes, why are they not leaving? But there was another thing coming. So uh, this is what it looked like. It's just, it's a beautiful old town where a lot of people that involuntarily came from Africa live and uh, still wear beautiful traditional dress. And um, yeah, Brazil was, was a, an interesting experience. It's not very safe there, but it's, on the, and it's also very beautiful. So you want to see more. This is, well, you know what this is. This is Rio de Janeiro where we sailed into one of those things like sailing into City Harbour, you know, that's really cool. And uh, um, then we went further south to uh, Parana Paranagua. And Paranagua is a, an area of um, mangroves and swamps, which has some towns, but the majority is waterways. So this is the truck, the taxi, the school bus. These boats go everywhere. You anchor there, and it's the same as parking your car in the middle of the highway. So these boats, they go left and right of you and they're waving at you because it's shallow. So you're literally anchoring in the middle of the highway and, uh, and yeah, they are very, very friendly people and they kept waving at us and <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. We had a good time, yeah. <laughs> then we went to Uruguay. A lot of perhaps older people know Punta del Este in Uruguay, which was a famous yachting place in the 1970s, I think, yeah. And it is, has, has this beautiful statue on the, uh, on the beach, uh, it's like a hand. And uh, so it, Uruguay is a small country, it's called the Switzerland of South America. And we hold out there uh, with the boat. And that goes a bit different than it does here. You know, they um, hold the boat out and then they prop it up with these uh, poles and a little catch under it. So every night before we went to bed, Peter went around the hammer to <laughs> these catches another whack. But it blows a lot there, so the boat's doing this while you're on the, on the catches. You see a boat behind us with the poles underneath. It's not for the faint hearted there. Uh, this is uh, Buenos Aires, and uh, this is the Club de Yates de Argentina. Very posh place where our queen, who is Argentinian, learned to sail in an opti. Um, Buenos Aires was a bit of a surprise for us, beautiful city, and uh, the Dutch embassy has been uh, great for us there. We were um, received like uh, what we felt royalty. Um, and then we went to uh, Mar del Plata, which is um, further south. First we had to fuel up. <laughs> You're on a pile mooring in this fancy club in, um, in Buenos Aires, and of course you can't go to a fuel dock, so everybody borrows everybody's jerry pants to fill up. <sighs> backbreaking work. Then we went to Mar Plata, which is on the on the, the fat side of um, Argentina. So here, here's Uruguay, and here is Buenos Aires, here is Mar Plata, and that's the base camp. That's where you get your boat ready for the tough stuff going south. And um, one of the things we needed was rope, lots of it. So this is 440 meters of 22 mil polyprop rope floating rope. Luckily, they deliver at home. You see the guy with the, the uh, how do you call that, equipment to bring it and the trolley. And then we had to, to unroll these things. That looks really easy. It isn't. It becomes one big bundle and, uh, uh, and cut it in two. So we had four times 110 meters of rope. Why do we need it? I'll come back to that. But we also took tango classes there, because you're in Argentina, you know, you know how to, you have to learn the tango. And uh, the Argentina is a lot better at it than the Dutch, <laughs> genetically, I think. Um, Argentina was in the middle of a fuel crisis, or an economic crisis, so also fuel was hard. The Marina Mar del Plata is about a kilometer away from the nearest gas station, Servo. And so here we are with the Jerry Pants and Wheelbarrow, we stand in line fill the jerrycans, walk back to the boat, walk back. Took us three and a half days to get 400 meters across. Okay, uh, there's lots, it's the place is known for the uh, big sea lions. They're, they're really big guys. And this one is sitting on the bulb of a uh, freighter. And uh, they're massive, these, uh, these ones. 
Yeah, they, if you go close to the dinghy to take a picture, then one sneaks up from behind and they're trying to get to your dinghy. <laughs> not, not, not what you want. So we're sailing down the Argentinian coast. We muster all our courage because it's a tough coast to sail and there's no place you can hide. The nearest place you can hide is Puerto de Seattle, which is about uh, a thousand miles south. So we get to there, it's a river, eight meters tidal range, five knots of current in the river, and on average, the wind will kick up to about 35 knots in the day. So we could go alongside Yamana, which is a tugboat slash pilot, um, when it was calm for two days, but then we had to anchor across the river, and there's no way our dinghy can you know, fight that current. So you're sitting on the other side of the river in all this current, and uh, um, yeah, it was really sad because we had so much fun with uh, Miguel, the, uh, the captain of the Yamana, and he had dinner on our boat. And um, the Dutch, there's something odd about the Dutch. There's some Dutch people here, the Dutch love mayonnaise. They don't do butter so much, but they eat a lot of mayonnaise. So I make mayonnaise by hand often. And um, so Miguel, when I turn around to do something, he would grab a bit of bread and just go through the bowl with the mayonnaise and eat the whole thing. So the mayonnaise was a big thing for him. So we're across the river looking at the town and we can't get there. The current is pushing us over the anchor. So Vita sort of crawled up the mast, took some pictures. We pretended to sleep that night and uh, next morning we go alongside. Miguel takes me in his car to Julio. Julio is a welder, an aluminium welder, bless his heart. And uh, Julio came and he goes, no, 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 no. So, Julio, 100 kilos, and his welding equipment, we hoist it in the mast. And for four hours, this guy has been welding this back in place. Because there was no way we were going to pull the mast. It's a Q-step mast. The boat is doing this. If they have a crane in that tiny little town, there is just no way we can keep the boat still enough to get it out. And this guy sits there, the sparks were flying, so for four hours, the two of us were just throwing buckets and buckets of water on our sails, on everything. Our backs had burn spots in them, <laughs> through our jackets, through everything. And then when all of this was done, we said, well, what do we owe you? Because the guy could have asked anything. And he said, mayonnaise, at the age of mayonnaise. <laughs> That's the only payment he wanted. And then we went back out to the anchorage. And then number three of the three musketeers, because Miguel, Julio, and David, they were friends, he shows up and uh, he says, I looked at the weather and you have a win window tomorrow morning. But you need to clear out, you need to do your internet, you need to do groceries, you need to get rid of your garbage, right? Yeah. So up in his big rip, he brought me ashore while Vitz was getting the boat ready and the next morning we left. And then we had, within a day, 50 knots of wind. <laughs> so that's why you keep looking at the mast and going, oh. But, um, and it's, the wind is so strong that it blows the water in your eyes. So this is literally wearing ski goggles here and gloves. And this is when we're hove to. <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit of a rough go there. And then you go through straight in there. And uh, it was Schouten in Le Mer. You know, in Tasmania, there's this island that everybody here calls Schouten Island. The proper way to say it is Schouten Island. And Schouten and Le Mer, they were on a Dutch boat coming from the town of Bourne in the Netherlands. And they found Strait Le Mer, and then they named Cape Bourne after their hometown of Bourne. And um, the Beagle Channel is, that's what everybody fears, and we were ready to be beaten by the Beagle Channel. Nothing. Flat water, whales playing around us. We should go do night watches and go into anchorages, and we just kept going all night, hugging each other, congratulations to each other. And here we come into um, Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world, the Argentinians say. And um, we tie up to next to the boat there. You see the people standing there, they're ready. We met them in Spain two years, two and a half years before. And we kept saying to each other, we'll see each other with Christmas in Ushuaia. It was like a joke. This is 18th of December, and we're tying up next to them in the Shire. Yeah, that's where. But you see, happy face. This is what it looked like from our boat. It is a beautiful place. And the big red boats are fishing boats, and uh, but this is also the base for most boats going to Antarctica. Well, we knew by then our mast was, you know, we couldn't get a surveyor or anybody near it, and you try to look with your x-ray eyes and think, oh, this looks all cool, but we were not going to go 
third grade and sixth grade are going to do. It was just like a... So we went to one of those uh, um, uh, last minute companies and we booked births on a survey ship. But this is for, again, Dutch people, a very important picture. Because our gun laws are so strict that a knife over 20 centimeters is considered a weapon and requires a license. In Argentina, you just go to the hardware store and you buy a knife like that. So we walk down the street with this thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, we put it on a pole because you have a lot of um, help on your anchor. So you need to cut it off. And that's why you use this on the broomstick, the knife. And um, so we're, we're here now. Here's where Ushuaia is. This is where Straight and Air is. And uh, then we went to Antarctica. The light blue stripes are the things we didn't do on our boat, but by land or by other ship. So, um, but if in Ushuaia, there's only one jetty where you can raft with perhaps 20 boats. So we could leave our boat there. But there were blocks on the sea floor. You have to hire a diver and bring your own chain, your own rope to make your own mooring. So this is the diver going down there. This is us on the boat going to Antarctica and all the, all the scientists, because it was a scientific boat, are very strict on um, seeds or anything you may have with you to contaminate there. So you have to vacuum clean all your clothes and all the Velcro and things. And um, yeah, this is one of our favorite boats, the black brow albatross, and it's such a beautiful picture. We've seen them a lot coming uh, around the south of Australia. This is our first iceberg. You know, it's uh, such a great experience. And uh, you see a lot of um, different um, pieces of ice. Uh, we sailed in the ice a lot, but I'll let you in on the secret. Uh, this is what we call a birdie pit. So it's white ice and it has air in it. So it's bluish white and it's usually a bit softer than this ice. This, uh, oh, this is a, um, a base. There's a lot of scientific bases on Antarctica read geopolitics. Everyone wants, everybody wants to have their foot in there. There's an Antarctic Treaty, so Antarctica is owned by nobody, but a lot of people are ready if this changes to take their um, slice of it. And um, the other ice, uh, you saw Orca there. Uh, the boat was diesel electric, so they could, if we saw wildlife, they could switch it to uh, electric. So we could look at Orca really close. This is a minky whale. Just a picture taken from the deck. It's that clear. And uh, they're very curious. They, uh, they, there were a bunch of people going in kayaks, and the Mickey Will would just come and lift the kayak with his, uh, his, his nose. <laughs> and uh, I love this picture. Look at the penguin. Okay. The penguin is uh, one is approaching the shore, and the other one is just jumping up. And in the background, you see these black military style dinghies we used to get, uh, get ashore. And really, you can't have a bad day if you've seen a thing with They are so funny, and they're so cute to look at. And um, so the penguins have their rookeries way up, because if they make it in the snow, and the mother or the father sits on the eggs or on the chips, then they drown the chips. So they make nests of pebbles, and they sit there. But they have to go all the way down to the sea to get food, and then come back up again. So if you're a penguin with feet like this, and you have to go through deep snow, it doesn't really work. So what they do is they use the same road all the time. The pink stuff is penguin poo, and, uh, but they use the same road all the time, which is, is convenient because they sort of make it deeper. But if you look, if you sit down and you look from the side, you get this. <laughs> and it looks so funny. And then they get to an intersection and then they look at each other and if it's a, a, a male and a female penguin, they do the act of making baby penguin, and then they go off again. It's so funny to see this. We sat for hours just looking at the penguins. These are gentoo penguins. Well, you keep taking pictures there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. If you ever get a chance, go there. And this is the other ice. This is uh, what we call a growler. So you have virgin bits, white air, slightly softer, Growlers, no air in it, really hard ice, and very hard to spot. It could be the size of, say, say a small table, which could totally punch in your boat, if you're not on a steel boat. So, um, but this is also really good ice to put in your whiskey. So, that's what the bed is for. And uh, um, we'll bring it back to the boat and have it in a glass at night. 
this is a uh, uh, one of the this is one of the lions of Antarctica. This is a really nasty uh, seal, leopard seal, and they catch their prey and drown it. And uh, so they, there were some people that wanted to swim there, which is beyond me. But uh, um, then these were the guys to watch out for. And uh, uh, this. <laughs> The penguins sometimes would just walk up to you like they were engaging in a conversation. So uh, I'm posing here a bit, pretending to have a conversation. <laughs> um, the British also have a base there, and the Antarctic Treaty says if you're not using a base for whatever, for scientific reasons, then you have to either take it away or use it again. So that's the the um, the deal. And the British would be British if they made their base into a museum, which even has a post office. So Port Lockhart is manned for uh, months per year by a team, and you can post a postcard there. <laughs> and it actually arrives wherever you send it to. Very funny. So uh, after Antarctica, we, um, so we passed Cape Horn on the way uh, up, and we passed Cape Horn on the north. A lot of people say, oh, why didn't you go to Cape Horn? Cape Horn is very Disney-fied. Disney-fied. Um, it means you go to the Armada, which is the Spanish, uh, the Chilean Coast Guard slash fishery inspection slash navy slash everything with boats. And they say, oh, you want to go to Cape Horn? Okay, on this anchorage, that, that, that one, and the weather looks good uh, tomorrow, so we see you back in four days. That's how it goes. You get a cruising license to go there, and you have to do exactly as they tell you. So we thought, why bother? We've been closed, we, uh, we go. And then you go into the Chilean Canal. So you go across Beagle Channel to Quetta Williams, which is Chilean, which is actually the southernmost city in the world. Tiny place. And uh, this is the Yacht Club. So just look around you, and then look at this Yacht Club. <laughs> it's a sunken ship, a sunken merchant ship, and it's the Yacht Club. So if you stand in the showers, you look below you, and you just see the seawater because the, the bottom of the ship is gone. And, uh, um, and everybody just laughs up to the ship. And you see here your long lines where it starts to come into play. And uh, it's a famous place. And then we leave into the Beagle Channel and we see this, it's called the Southern Right Whale Dolphin. It doesn't have a dorsal fin. And they're really beautiful dolphins. And uh, this is, and again, the Beagle Channel should be terrible we weather, and it was fantastic. And this is our first anchorage, it's called Glacier Alley. So it's a, um, it's the Beagle Channel, the main channel, what you see there. And there's a little anchorage. This is a, a, a large one for, um, for, for Patagonia. You anchor with your back into the wind. It's something people, it's, it's hard to explain why you have to do that. It is because it slopes really quick. So if you anchor with your face in the wind, then the anchor will go down, and in the end, you'll be very busy re-anchoring. So you anchor with your back into the wind, you anchor uphill, but you need to stay there. That's why you have the long ropes. So you drop the anchor, let go of the chain until you, uh, the anchor holds, then one stays on the boat to keep the boat behind the anchor, the other one gets in the dinghy, ties the line, one of the four lines around the waist, rows like mad to the shore, runs to the nearest tree, ties the boat to the tree, and you repeat this another time, so you have two lines to the shore, and you anchor in front. That's the two-point tie. Most of the times we've done a four-point tie or a six-point tie. We'll get to that later. So this, the same anchorage, Lisa took the picture of the boat and then turned around and took this picture of me. So that's how close you are to the glaciers. It's a really, it's an amazing place. And the temperature is, is it's not that cold. It looks very cold, but it's not that cold. These they call um, arboles banderas, flag trees. They, there are lots because it always blows hard there. And uh, um, this is a, a, a beautiful glacier. And you're sitting there looking at the glacier and they're like, oh, should we put the dinghy in the water, you know, and then sail the boat in front of the glacier and then take the picture? Ah, cool idea. Rita said, I'll do the boat. You sit in the dinghy. <laughs> and <laughs> then when the boat goes away, you're sitting there and the dinghy, you think, oh, shit, you know, because there's lots and lots of ice around you and uh, um, makes funny noises. So Rita came back and uh, we have our beautiful pictures of the boat in front of, uh, of the glacier. And uh, this is another picture of the um, Glacier Alley. So here in, in the back you see where we came out. 
And uh, this is a typical anchorage again with the lines to the shore. And uh, it's, uh, it's another way of, it's just quite, you know, you get nice and warm after you've done the anchoring and the line. Um, and you need that because it's, uh, it rains a lot. And uh, we bought these gloves that people use in warehouses where it's very cold. They were like $5 and they were very handy. We used them a lot because it rains a lot. And um, then, uh, so to get water, it's very easy. You just, we, we never go to sea without swimming noodle. There was these colorful long things. We use them for everything. And uh, this, we made a dam with the noodle and the water just flows into our water tank. We're not very picky with water, a lot of people are, but um, if we don't trust the source, one of us will drink a glass, we wait two hours, not sick, okay, fill the tank. <laughs> uh, we don't, we're not very picky with that. So we would also go to waterfalls to uh, get some water, just with a funnel and a little jerry can and get our water. And uh, so after two months, you get to your first village. So this is a village where 75 people live. And, uh, um, and they're all um, the, the, the last remaining um, indigenous people there. Heavily subsidized, lots of problems, but uh, it was interesting to be there. But the wind wasn't really cooperating, so they... Well, they do, they have tugboats there. They tow docks for um, um, fish farms. And with stuff for fish farms, and they were on a big mooring. So we could go alongside the tugboat. And the captain of the tugboat, he said, I have to do a good deed every day, and today you're my project. And they had a washing machine. <laughs> so after two months, so <laughs> and showers. So here you see another example of the anchoring. It's so remote. There's 20 boats, sailboats there every year. 20 boats in the season. There's one guy doing a radio net. So for weeks, you don't see anybody. And you really have to survive for months on the food stores you have on the boat. And, uh, uh, but it's so exciting to do it, to really manage this together and uh, to do this. This is me with the lines. So we had two big corals um, in the front of the boat and two big tubs, like garbage tubs in the back with, it, with the ropes coiled in it. And here you do some mountaineering with your uh, rope. <laughs> I'll get you going, come on, come on, I can't keep the boat. Because the rocks could be 10 meters away from you, so you really have to be quick. And the problem is that in those little anchorages, there's always a resident sea lion or a lot of dolphins, and they don't want you to row around them. So they keep knocking, you know, they keep pushing at the dinghy. So you're rowing, and you can't use your outboard because of the kelp. So you really have to row it. I've broken Olympic records crawling around trees. <laughs> but it's so worth it. If you look at this, it's just so beautiful. And, uh, and then we came to Glacier Amalia, and Amalia is for us, it's the name of our crown princess, and uh, so it's Glacier happens to be called Amalia, so we thought it was very cool to be there. And uh, yeah, lots of birdie bits. And this is the setup, so you see a tub with the rope in it on the right, then the blue one is my messenger rope, so I throw that first, and then the bigger light goes behind it. And the yellow one and the white one were, if we had to do a six-point tie, these were the extra ropes we would put out them. And this is Strait Magellan, the, the waterway you see Strait Magellan. Navigable, we were going against the wind and against the current, navigable from four in the morning until 12, and after that, done. Too much wind, no way we could work ourselves in. And then you meet somebody else, you know, you're on the radio and you know this other boat is coming your way. And, uh, Oh, you know, you're all excited. And uh, so you have your lines out and your anchor. You see here the lines and the anchor. And then another boat comes. So back in the dinghy, one line out, they anchor on one side. And the biggest thing you can do is say, oh, let me do your lines. You know? And then, so in total, you're with two anchors and eight lines uh, out. In this, you see how small the bay is. And uh, yeah, you've been doing this for months. So it's like, Okay, they'll do for dinner. <laughs> There's no, not changing for dinner or stuff like that. And I've, I've given people an apple that we have, that we still had apples. And they're like, oh, an apple, you know, <laughs> with the bubble wrap around it. And, um, and then the further north you get, the more um, you start to see um, fishing boats and um, people. And you know, this, this is another place where you uh, then come. You see me here with two bags. This is three months worth of garbage. 
and you're walking around like, what can I get rid of the trash? This is a uh, fog rainbow, a fog rainbow. So it's uh, it was very foggy, and the sun makes a rainbow in there still. We have never seen that before, and it was it was a special thing because it, it we saw this, and at that moment, just after, shortly after that, we found out that his father died. So it was a sail and a stick for a mast. And he said, do you know how to manage a sailboat? And we go, yeah, we think we can. So we rowed out to the wind <laughs> and just sailed up and down a bit, and then we came back. But it was such a great feeling to, in such a high altitude to be sailing. And uh, then we went to the Salado Uni, the salt plains of Uyuni in Bolivia. And um, if you, this, is, this picture is taken at five in the morning. And then there's a, a thin layer of water on top of the salt. And uh, so it acts as a mirror, and uh, yeah, then you can take some pretty, pretty nice pictures. And uh, it took us a day and a half to get across the salt bay. Then another trip, we flew to Suriname, which is a former Dutch colony. It's Dutch Guiana. It's next to French and British Guiana. And um, with a twin otter plane, we flew to the north of the Amazon, and we stayed with an Indian village for a few days. And they go in these boats. They go out. It was very cool. It took a few days before we found out you couldn't drink the water there. <laughs> we had been drinking the water all the time. It was not a problem. And then, um, and then all of a sudden my mother, who's 81, said, Oh, you're in Suriname. Oh, hang on. I can fly direct, pretty close to where you guys are. So we, we had an actual rendezvous in Curacao with my mum, uh, which made her part of the adventure also. That was nice. And then uh, we rented a camper van, and we know Wicked Campers is, has a bad name here, not in South America. And then uh, we went to, um, to the parts of the country in uh, Chile, in Argentina, that uh, we really wanted to go to. It's called the Lake District. First we went to Chiloé, which is the biggest island of Chile, and it has a huge tidal range, so it has houses on stilts. And um, uh, then we went to the Lake District. If you ever have a chance to go to South America, Nobody goes there. Only local tourists go there, go to Chiloé and to the Lake District, and it's beautiful. And people sail there. They have their Bavarias and their Hanses and their Genos there. And they, we say, well, why don't you sail on the coast? And they go, nah, you know, with the tsunamis, it's too dangerous. Look at the, uh, the volcano there. <laughs> I mean, that was the only one with the top intact. All the others you could see. You could see five when you're standing there, and they want this little fluffy brown on the top. You think, oh, really? You want your boat here? <coughs> this is the tiny marina on the river where we had our, um, our boat. And of course, we were doing boat work. Uh, we needed to do some maintenance. So this is my beloved husband in the holding tank. The white things are his feet. He's really good at this. Uh, we also, uh, it was just you know, a grassy area. We were there with six little board cruises and for the rest it was just you know local people having their boats there so uh, yeah we, you could use everything fix yourselves we had a great time there and uh, this is our famous hand cranked singer sewing machine we have on the boat if you look on our boat and you think wow they have good looking covers and do check out our fender covers all made with that little machine and uh, so the horseshoe shaped boys on the back made with that little machine and it works and this is, this is a bit of a story. This is a bungee kayaking. Let that sink in for a bit. Bungee kayaking. We, had, we have only one dinghy, an inflatable dinghy, and um, we thought we need a spare. If we lose the dinghy, we can't get to shore if we're angry. So we need something spare. The Chilean peso dropped in value towards the euro, and we saw a, a special on these inflatable kayaks, so we thought, bang, we have one. The owner of the store said, oh, no problem, you know, I'm going to go kayaking with my girlfriend soon, so we inflate this thing and then we go together. Wonderful. So, yak and yak and yak, we kayak with him along an island, and he said, then we go on the other island, we go back. It's a bit upstream, but you'll be okay. Well, this thing has the hydrodynamics of a brick. So, while they, on their rigid kayaks, were yakking along and kayaking, what took us 20 minutes to go down took us an hour and a half to get back up. We were close to vomiting by the time we made it there. So we roll up this thing, shove it in the boat, never to look at it again. So, oh, that's just a shame. So what we did is, okay, go on back, no, back. 
we put a line on the front of the boat, tie it to a fender. We're sitting in a kayak. I have the fender between my knees. So we float back on the tide, paddle back to the boat, float back on the tide, paddle back to the boat, bungee kayaking. And so that's how we learn how to manage this thing and how to actually move with it. Um, this is Wolfgang, a German guy who lived on a mountain in Chile. Unfortunately, he doesn't do it anymore, and he ran the radio net in uh, uh, Patagonia. But he loved to come to the harbor and talk to the cruisers, so he would run the net from our boat. So this is our, our chart table, and he's doing it with our radio. Um, it can go horribly wrong. This is a public, a French friend of us, and with little English. And uh, you would say, oh, but how are you? And everything from a little bit bad to very bad, he would always say, oh, it is a fucking mess. And <laughs> so he sent us a, an email saying, it is a fucking mess. And so, well, what's wrong? Well, this was wrong. He had a problem with his anchor winch. He went to Punta Arenas, which is not really a place to go with a yacht. He anchored and went ashore quickly to do something. The wind changes and his boat is slammed into the concrete dock with no fenders. So the black line you see here, this is his deck coming through the hull. This is, and so, but you know, the good thing about a steel boat, you cut out eight meters by one meter, weld it back in, fix the interior, off we went, six weeks, six weeks later. And uh, so now we're fast forwarding a bit. This is us getting ready to go um, into the Pacific. We knew the first place where we reliably could get food was going to be Hawaii. We're now in South America. So we needed to be fully provisioned for six months. So we tie boxes with food to the table, to everything. There's food everywhere. And off we went. So we left Chile, go to uh, Isla Juan Fernandez, which is Robinson Crusoe Island. That's where Selkirk uh, set. Then to Easter Island. Then to French Polynesia, the south of French Polynesia, which is uh, Gambier. And then the plan was to sail up to Hawaii but it went wrong halfway. Global warming, El Nino, the weather was, it was not safe enough to keep going. So we gave up all our easting, hung a left to the Marquesas, and waited there for five days to decide what to do. In the end, we went to, um, to Hawaii. Halo around the sun, never good, never good news. Uh, and this is where Selkirk sat and uh, looked for a ship, because he was marooned, he looked for a ship. And, um, and you see the dog, which is not our dog. Um, in Chile, they love dogs, but a lot of people have no space in their house to have a dog. So there's stray dogs that everybody takes care of. So in Santiago, for instance, the capital, you'll see bowls with dog food and water at bus stop. Dogs ride buses, because they are adopted by the restaurants, and they're given food at the restaurant. People crowdfund for the vet bill for a dog. And these dogs, they just, come with you, they walk with you up to this uh, viewing point and in return for half your sandwich. You know, they, and they bark if you take the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong path, they'll bark and they come back for you, it's so fun. And uh, uh, going from Chile to uh, Easter Island, it's, you can be out of luck and have no wind. And it's such a long way. And we have a 2,000 mile motoring range on our boat, which is for a sailboat a lot. But still, we couldn't start the engine. So I was sitting there for days, going, look, we're doing one and a half knots. Whoa, you know? And uh, so we put, um, we pulled out a Yankee, but we used the boom as the pole for our Jenica. It was a bit of an innovation, but it worked. And it brought us up to two and a half knots. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, Rizzo does the sextant navigation. I find that a very, um, a uh, high art, and uh, I do the, the writing down of the things he tells me to write down, but we took those all the calculations. So we found Easter Island on the Saxon navigation of paper charts. And uh, then you get to Easter Island, and you're, oh, you're so excited, and you anchor there, 24 meters deep, two miles offshore on the sandbank, no harbor there. And then you look and you see guys on surfboards, and you think, ah, yeah, how are we going to go there? And then there, there's one other boat, a local, and he said, oh, you know, I'll help you, I'll show you how to do it. So in the end, we made it to shore. We could stay there for a week. You're not allowed to leave the boat. Always one has to stay with the boat. There's three anchorages, so you have to move around the island if the wind changes. And we were super lucky because they allowed us to go off the boat because the weather calmed down. 
and we didn't have to move the boat. So we could rent a scooter and go around the island. But this is one of my favorite pictures. This is one of the statues of Easter Island that I wrote. And so this is the other anchorage. <laughs> So uh, uh, very recommendable, and uh, uh, this is the third one, and this is the um, beach where Jacob Rochevein, another intrepid Dutch person, landed. He was the first European contact there, and he named it Easter Island. And uh, so now we're further, now we're in the south of French Polynesia, and this is the island of Gambier. And um, Gambier is, is surrounded by a reef, which you see in the distance. And uh, so the boat here at the anchorage at the capital with uh, the whole group of islands has 1,500 inhabitants. And this is the capital. So, um, and it has two really cool mountains to climb on, but the place is known for the black pearls. You see the black pearl in the picture? And uh, it's over there. So we went to the pearl farms and uh, had a good look. And everything has to be brought there. There's a, a freighter that comes once, um, at once a month with vegetables and things and um, so liquor is hugely expensive in Chile liquor is very cheap so we bought bottles of whiskey for 10 euro which is in dollars um, and, uh, um, and they cost over 150 dollars in uh, there so we said oh you know we have whiskey would you like to trade that for pearls oh yeah so we had some really nice pearls. <laughs> it was a, a classic win-win situation. And uh, so we had to divert. We sailed up north and we fought and fought to keep our easting, but we had to give up. And then you go into the Bay of Virgins. And um, this is in Fatouipa in uh, French Polynesia, very well known. And um, uh, there's a bit of a joke uh, around it because the Bay of Virgins in French is the Bay de Vierges, Virgin. But if you take one eye out, it's Bay de Verge, and that's what it really was called. Verge is a um, gentleman's private pub. So uh, and you, if you look at the rocks, you can sort of figure out why it was called that. And uh, so you anchor there, and uh, and we sat there and going, okay, New Zealand, Hawaii, New Zealand, Hawaii, New Zealand, Hawaii, and this goes on for five days. And then we said it's going to be Hawaii. Look at the flag. You've seen Lisa with the sextant. You saw what the flag looked like. This is what the flag looked like a month later. And uh, so we had a uh, bad weather going to Hawaii, but we made it in the end, and we were very, very pleased we made it. And um, you have to go with, with a big turn because of the trade winds. You can't go direct because you have to go against the wind. So you have to make easting, and then you can quickly make a turn. So um, this is Radio Bay in Hawaii. So it's the big island of Hawaii, and Radio Bay is classic bay where all the yachts go. And that's where the government also sort of expects you to come. And uh, they said to us, you know, you you have to tie to the dock here, but you can't go ashore here because it's a container terminal. So we want you to take your dinghy and go to a park. But beware, there's people in the park. And they are bad people. So they steal things. So you have to lock your dinghy and everything. We said, oh. Thank you very much. Why don't you make a little path, you know, that we can go over the, over the container terminal, but no. So we take it in, we go ashore, and of course there's these huge fat Hawaiian Polynesian guys sitting there having their beer and looking at us. And so we go to them and we said, well, guys, they told us that there's really dangerous people here who steal things. So could you keep an eye on our dinghy when these people come? And they were laughing because they knew this was about them. And they're the big guy, they go, yeah, sure. So the next day we come, we say, well, we really would like to put our folding bicycles here also. Could you also keep an eye on those? Yeah, yeah. But they had, uh, despite all the drinking, they had these beautiful outrigger canoes. It was the first time we saw them. And um, they were going out to them. So one day, me with my big mouth, I go and I said, can we go with you in these? And they were going, really? A howdy? That's what we are there, a howdy. And, uh, um, and they looked and they said, okay. So we went with them, with huge guys, and we went rowing. Normally they would go for 20 minutes. With us, they really tired us into an hour and a half of rowing. <laughs> but it was fun. This is Pearl Harbor. Perhaps you know the image. This is in Hawaii, where the, uh, on, on the island of Oahu, where the American ships were bombed. And the white structure is over the ship Arizona. So if you're standing on it, you actually see the ship. And behind it is another one. 
BTK's sextant classes, and uh, this is in Hawaii. <laughs> there was a whole row of guys standing there with a sextant. I thought it was the funniest thing, <laughs> and, uh, and they, uh, they appreciated it. And they, in return, one of the guys says, oh, I have this great idea. Uh, I'm going to do something with you guys. And he rented this Harley Davidson motorbike, and we drove around the island with him, because he also had a Harley, but he had no mates to ride with. So I think it was more a gift for himself. <laughs> And uh, this is Vita surfing. For Australians, this is, okay, you go surfing. For us, oh, this was very cool, because this is a Waikiki beach, and you're surfing. Yeah. And uh, so then from Hawaii, again, with a huge turn because of the um, North Pacific Highway, you had to go all the way around it to get to uh, Sitka in Alaska. And uh, so we were crossing the, the um, Loxodrome route, so the direct route of all the big freighters. So we saw a lot of shipping, more than we normally see. We have AIS, of course, and you know, these guys are bored, usually all males, so I go with a female voice on the radio and have a little chat, and you know, it's usually a nice conversation. This guy goes, where are you, where are you? And we said, well, look at your screen, you know, it's Anna Caroline itself. No, you have to stop what you're doing, it's dangerous. Oh, I see your boat going up and down. And we go, yeah, we feel it, we're in the boat, but it's cool. And he kept on going, you have to stop what you're doing. And he took a picture of what he saw, and he said, I can imagine his, his fear, because that's us there. <laughs> this is what he saw from his window. So we're still Facebook friends with him. And um, we set up with the University of Hawaii, we set up a, um, uh, a project. To, um, to use cruisers as a citizen, it's called citizen science. So you use cruisers to do observations and document things um, for, um, in this case, plastic pollution. And uh, so I'm on the radio and we're talking to the other boats about what they saw and what they uh, learned and, and everybody took pictures of the plastic pollution. We did this with the University of Hawaii. This is us arriving in Sitka after 21 days of cold, very grey weather, so uh, happy faces. And, um, and then you have to make a choice, because there's so much to see there. And this is one of the things we really wanted to see, see a bear catch a salmon in the river. And uh, so you were standing on a platform looking down, and uh, there we saw it happen. You don't go for a walk there like that. You always take your, um, your bear spray, you have a little holster with bear spray and you bear bell, you make noise all the time, or you sing. In my case, making noise is not a problem, but um, this is fake news. This is very much fake news. They call this a bald eagle. It is not bald. It took us a long time to figure that one out. And uh, it's a very, very beautiful place. You can take pictures as long as you want there. And uh, we sailed around Glacier Bay. Oh, oh, it's, but a lot of it is also, uh, was industrial. They had little villages on logs, so the houses were on logs, the school was on logs, and they towed them. In the winter, they were chopping wood down, and then in summer, they would fish and, uh, and can the fish on the spot. So you see these old canneries still in Alaska everywhere. Now it's all too small, so now it's all big industrial ships. But the old stuff is still there. This picture is one of the best. Um, it's a stranded iceberg, so there's, um, uh, a big, well-known glacier. The arm you go to is 25 miles long, it's called Tracy Arm, and at the end is the Soya Glacier. And we really, really wanted to go there, and the glaciers, of course, in the past were much longer, so they push uh, Maureen and dirt ahead of them, so that forms a dam, but now the glaciers are retreating, so 25 miles of the glacier is gone, but at the beginning, there's still this little dam underwater of the marine. And that's where these carved icebergs, so bits of the glacier, you can actually get really close. It, it can topple over and things, bits can break off. You have to be careful. But uh, yeah, we went a bit close because the picture was really nice. And uh, then after five hours in the, in the ice, we went to the, the Soya Glacier. So this is uh, the picture we took there. Uh, with the self-release on the camera, so you see Vita's eyes going, yeah, it's doing it, no. <laughs> and then we sailed all the way back, and then well, there was this super yacht coming, and they said, well, how far did you get? Because we knew that the tracer arm had been full with pack ice, and it took us a long time to get through. 
And we said, yeah, we went all the way to the glacier. Said, oh, he said, you're the first boat this year that got there. <laughs> and, uh, and you see glaciers everywhere there in Alaska. And, uh, and the milky water, you see, that's all the sediment in the water. And this is the new version of those floating houses, the floating villages. This is the floating house. It floats on logs this size. And this is actually a marina. So they say, oh, you know, you tie up next to the greenhouse. And you think the greenhouse. But so there's there's docks and then there's houses and boats just tied up to them. <laughs> um, this is Chetbox Falls. This is uh, further south again, and uh, uh, a well-known waterfall that has been here So it's not a big waterfall, but this is how you get there, and you have to go through rapids in uh, uh, in Alaska and in British Columbia and. Yeah, in general, the Americans say, oh, you know, it's a world's fastest rapid. You know, that's a, a, a way to say it, but we just thought, oh, it can't be that bad, you know, <laughs> how Dutch people, classic, underestimate things. So one rapid we went through, and the boat literally went down the stairs, <laughs> so we learned quick. And, uh, and yeah, and then you sail into San Francisco, and again, one of the highlights, Rio de Janeiro, San Francisco, Sydney, those are the things, the days you remember forever. And uh, we wintered in San Francisco, and it's a city you can, you can be forever and still haven't seen everything. And we went backpacking again, so we backpacked to Mexico. This is the before picture, everybody can see it in Mexico. And so after a few days later, it looks a lot less uh, uh, full. <laughs> we lost a lot of weight there. And uh, we took a cooking class, we do this in every country we go to, we take a cooking class. And uh, so here we're making uh, Mexican food. And uh, put on some weight again, and oh, all the all the old Inca monuments and the stories behind it. It's uh, it was a really beautiful trip. It was about a month we backpacked around there. Very nice. And then one of the magazines we worked for, they called us and they said, "You're in San Francisco, right? Yeah. So you're not that far from Bermuda. You go buy an atlas or something or look at the map." But no, no, we're not that far from Bermuda. No, no. What do you want us to do? We're going. Yeah, we would like you to go there and, you know, do a, a part on the preparations for the America's Cup. And we said, oh, you know, we'll see if we can do that. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> so, who is this to the left of us? To Markham. Oh, nice. And Russell Coots, James Spithill, all the rock stars we interviewed. It was five days we were there, and it was five days like, oh! And uh, so we wrote a lot of articles about it. and. Uh, and of course, got to see all the sailing and the preparation that was going on there. So then, again, a long haul from um, San Francisco all the way down to the Marquesas again. And uh, so it was 25, 21 days, and um, uh, it was a good trip. It was a very good crossing. Uh, apart from one day when we caught this enormous net in our prop. So we have a, uh, what we call, it's a deck snorkel, and, and it's, a, it's an Australian product, right? Yeah. Aqua, aqua dive? Yeah, people call it a hookah. So it's a, it's a compressor, you run it off your batteries, and then uh, and it's a floating tank on the water. And uh, we wouldn't go to sea without it now anymore, because we've had to use it twice now, and, uh, and we use it also for um, uh, changing um, um, the zinc on the shaft or inspecting things. Really works well. So poor Risa, again, in the water, and um, taking it off. Um, this is arriving in um, uh, French Polynesia, which has these very dramatic cliffs and a beautiful uh, um, area. Very, there's a, there's a, a great, secret, the best kept secret about sailing in the South Pacific. Do you know what it is? Some people have been sailing there. It's the lousy weather. Because <laughs> everybody thinks you're know, all the time in the sun. No, it rains a lot there, that's why it's so green. And um, so, uh, you see here, it's very wet. We wanted to buy this beautiful uh, wooden uh, car of the horn, so we bought it, and this guy wanted to show it to us. <laughs> and uh, he was a very clever guy, because he used to do copra, which is the shell of uh, um, um, coconuts, but that's hard work and dirty work. So he thought, oh, these cruisers, that's much better. So they have these little roofs that they dry the coconuts under. And he thought, I'm going to spring some washing line there, because these people all need their laundry done. So he charges through the roof per load. But you know, 
there's no other way you can dry it on your boat because it rains all the time. So he dries it under there. And then you go after two days, you pick up your laundry, and he goes, no, 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 not only the laundry. And then you go with him behind his house, and he starts picking fruit, and he literally fills your dinghy with fruit. And, and then the washing on top of it, there was no place for me left in the dinghy. <laughs> and he says, that is all included in the washing. So in the end, it was a good balance. This is just a joke, this picture. This is in the two motors. So these are these low-lying atolls where you go in and... Um, there's nothing there, and we just, with other cruises, snorkeling, having a wonderful time. And this is just a nice picture of the boat. <laughs> if, if somebody's wondering, it's, she's Bruce Roberts, and um, 44 offshore, built in New Zealand. And then you get to Papete in Tahiti, and there's markets, and there's food, and there's stuff. And, uh, and the people wear these beautiful crowns with flowers. Morea. The well-known uh, picture, I think a lot of people who sail there have the same similar picture. And uh, lots of boats there. And this was the um, finish, the last races of the America's Cup. So we saw all our heroes there. And a lot of people were sitting there are New Zealanders. And uh, this, is a, um, this is an interesting picture of people having a party. What you see in uh, Polynesia, in, especially in French Polynesia, is that um, the people were living in very small groups. And they have funny traditions. For instance, to keep the gene pool healthy, they give babies away between villages. And, uh, but what you also see is in the family, if there's only boys, the youngest son is raised as a girl. Some of these girls, some of these boys, just, you know, um, are heterosexual men and live their lives that way later on. Others don't. And, um, and there's a, a group in between that lead a heterosexual life that look female. How many women are in this picture? One, two, three. Yeah, the two on the outside are female, and the one in the middle is a man. And you get so used to it, and, uh, uh, and yeah, it's just the way it is there. It's the way they do things. And we were there with the Haiva. And the Haiva is a competition between all the villages, with dance, with song, uh, with um, all sorts of um, um, skills spear throwing, running with bananas, um, all these things. But the dancing bit, ah, we loved it. It was beautiful. That's when they do the hip shaking thing, and uh, yeah, they take this very serious. And it's all local. It's not for tourists. We this was a village where we were just anchored off, and uh, we would come in, and uh, and they would invite us to come, and we were the only white people there. This is Bora Bora. You've heard of Bora Bora. This is Bora Bora. It's just beautiful. And this is, we like this even better. This is Suvorov. Suvorov is in uh, one of the Cook Islands, and it's a nature reserve. Nobody lives there. The two ranges are dumped there six months per year. And to keep an eye on the yachts coming in, they basically live off the bit of supplies they are given, but mostly they live off what the yachts give them. And uh, in return, they have a good story. And uh, our American neighbor, he had a drone. And he flew the drone over. We were just with three boats in the anchorage, and he flew the drone over us. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's, just, it's like our boat's a spaceship. <laughs> and uh, this is their kitchen, office, living room, everything. These are the two park rangers, and we're clearing out here. <laughs> it's very informal. And they have a king, a coconut crab staff. This guy is the size of a football, and they are red or green or blue and they have very strong claws and they go up the tree and they and, and they can literally crack the coconut. Now we're in Samoa and uh, um, here is uh, uh, the tradition to wear the lava lava, the skirt, and we were invited to go to church and uh, well with a group of cruisers we wanted to blend in. So we go to the store for the lava lava, and the lady in the store sort of looks at Vitsa, and as you can see, Vitsa's not a very fat guy. So she looks at him, and she goes, hmm, because the Samoan men are rather large uh, by nature, but they also eat uh, a lot. And uh, so we ended up in the children's department, because <laughs> the other thing had to go around ten times, and he couldn't walk anymore. So this is literally a children's lava lava. And look at the guy, you see the sign, but the guy is wearing a skirt. 
they're very dressed, you know, they're very prudish. So the guy is wearing a skirt. We love that. And uh, they have these valleys, so they build their houses around this roof, and that's where they have their meetings, and that's where everybody comes together. Very traditional in uh, Samoa. Oh yeah, the family is buried on the grounds of the of where the community lived. So they don't sell their property, they stay there generation after generation. And this is the, uh, this is a baka. A baka is a traditional double hold canoe. This one is the Galofa. And uh, you see in the distance the uh, cathedral of uh, Apia in Samoa. The Polynesian Voyaging Society has, has had to build 11 of these boats and given it to the different kingdoms and countries in Polynesia to help them find back the, um, um, the traditional sailing skills. This one actually sails up and down to um, uh, New Zealand, no problem. And um, they, uh, a lot of them have female captains, and Vita has taught in Tonga and in Samoa sextant navigation to these groups. Um, now we're in Tonga, and in Tonga, perhaps you notice, they wear these mats around their waist. It's a, a sign, Tonga, the Tongan society is very layered, very hierarchical, so the people in the upper levels, they have these beautifully woven mats around their waist. The girls have strings, the boys have these mats, and we were at the funeral there, and there, and then they are completely encapsulated in a mat. The bigger the mat, the bigger the mourning, or the wealthier the people are. And what you buy there is peanuts, but you buy them on the, on the plant still. So you have to dry them outside in the sun, and then you can eat the peanuts. Now we're in Fiji, and this is kava. So this is the root of the, it's a pepper plant, and it's the root, and they, they mash it, and they pour water over it, and then they drink it together in a very ceremonial thing. Has one of you ever tried kava? Yeah. Looks like mud tastes like mud. <laughs> And uh, um, we went to a market there, and uh, we took buses all over um, Fiji, uh, preferably to the places where the tourists don't go. So we ended up on this market, and Rita took a picture of one guy, and then everybody wanted to be in the picture. So we spent hours in this market chatting to people, and what you see there is a lot of Indian people uh, next to the, living next to the Melanesians. It's an interesting mix. And there was an event going on um, with, uh, um, it was for women empowerment. They were showing off all their skills. And this, these are the jurors looking at all the products that the women uh, brought in. And um, this is what they call pig birth. Have you seen that before? It's, uh, uh, hmm? it's what they do in Fiji. They, they like to keep the cruises there and, and, and avoid that they go to New Zealand or Australia. So they dig a hole. They put your keel in the hole, and then they put car tires around the hole. So if you're only there for a quick bottom job, they'll prop you up like this. But if you're staying longer, you're going to be like this or like this. And uh, that prevents your boat being blown over in, uh, in case of a, of a cyclone. And it's so strange, because you walk around, and it looks like a marina, but there's sand everywhere, and it's really secure, unless there is a big flooding, because then the boat will float up. When we were there, it was Diwali, so we also went around to look at the beautiful decorated houses. And then we left Fiji to go to New Zealand. And uh, the first days, you know, you have to really punch into a lot of wind. So that was not very pleasant. And it was a terrible trip anyway, because after three days, the punching was done. It blew so hard that the, our flag blew off its flagpole. And um, after three days, no wind. We parked ourselves in this huge high. So we're motoring along, and then um, our autopilot checks up. So six days hand steering. Okay. Then all our batteries fried. So it went from that to another to another. We were so happy when we were in New Zealand. So then the famous clearing into New Zealand, you know, where they take all your stuff. It's, everybody says Australia is the worst. It's not. It's an equal place with New Zealand, and they're both not bad as long as you are prepared. And, um, and then we have a look around. This is um, a war canoe in uh, Waitangi in um, New Zealand. This is the head of the war canoe. And um, the last picture is Cape Reinga. This is the northernmost point uh, of New Zealand, which we passed uh, seven months later on our way to New Caledonia. From New Caledonia, we crossed to uh, Australia. How did we do in time? 
Did we do too long? Oh, okay. <laughs> Then, um, the, so Rita has been managing the time. Um, we change roles now. So if you have any questions, what I do, I repeat your question and then give the microphone to Rita. So, are there any questions? Uh, Australia is, of course, the safest country. Most dangerous. Most dangerous, yeah. Most dangerous by far. Most dangerous. <laughs> Which months were you around in East Raft and through the Beatles Channel and so on? Uh, that was, um, uh, we came in with Christmas. Uh, so repeat, repeat the question. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the times that we were in the Patagonian Canals and Ushuaia. Um, so we were with Christmas in, um, and New Year in Ushuaia. And in January, we started uh, our way uh, up, and we took about three months to get to Valdivia. Well, Britain won that trip. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wh which route are you planning to take from here to get back to um, Europe? Are you going through the Red Sea, or are you going to South Africa? South Africa. <laughs> Repeat the question. Yeah, uh, the, the route uh, uh, from here, um, we don't like to sail with, uh, to, with having to look over our shoulder all the time. So we dismissed uh, the Red Sea quite quickly. And actually, uh, the big organized uh, piracy is over. I was in the Navy and a lot of my old colleagues are still there. Um, they, they were able to fight at least the, the main command centers of the pirates. So that's gone. But after that, they start the Civil War again, and so there's hunger. And now the, uh, the local fishermen, they saw how it had to be done. But they don't go for the big ships because they only have small boats and they are not organized. So they go for the yachts now. And so we said, well, there's no way that we are going to do it. Uh, we heard of a friend of ours who, who did, and he went through. So it can be done, but uh, we want to. And by the way, we did Cape Port now. We did Cape the Wind now. So, you sort of have to do... <laughs> Got to do good hope, yep. Had you done a lot of sailing prior to this trip? Nah. <laughs> well... Had you done a lot of sailing yeah. prior to this trip? Um, one of the things you have to realise is uh, it's quite special what you're doing. It's, it's different. That means also that the relationship you have built up in normal society working so we thought, let's do a test here um, on a smaller boat. We had a 31-foot hard shine steel boat. Let's do a test. If you find out after a year or one and a half year, nah, it was not so great. And you have given up your house and your job and your this and that. So we did a test here. Um, but before that, we sailed a lot uh, each. Uh, I sailed from my fourth. Did uh, a lot of dinghy sailing, did sailed races for the Navy. I was in the Navy, I did races for them at sea for 18 years. Uh, Jan Kess sailed um, uh, traditional barges that we uh, have in, in Holland, these big, uh, big barges. So, uh, yeah, we did a lot of sailing before that. But the sailing is not the hard part, it's the logistics that's, that's what counts. Do I have my spare parts? Do I have enough food? Do I have my water? Uh, most of the time you go downwind anyway, so whatever you put up, you get there. <laughs> <laughs>